morning to you all. Um, Janice and myself from the SNRD Community Management uh, would like to invite you to our today's session about Real Talk, um, how to easily produce video testimonials of project stakeholders. So uh, we have our long-term uh, website editor and communication expert Pascal Corbe in our open office hour today. And uh, Pascal uh, was a former colleague of some of us. Uh, he was working um, for GIZ in Bonn and Ashbourne, is now our SNRD communication consultant. Um, former, he had worked in the global donor platform for UNAID and UNICEF and the African Union and has lived amongst others in Southern Africa and Kenya. So why are we doing this format? Um, in the SNRD um, Africa, we have experienced that communication about our projects, but also um, yeah, in our whole sector network, um, if it's done and placed well, it can be a true benefit. And um, not only for the sector network itself, but also for our projects. And um, communication products like articles or videos can not only motivate us, but also inspire us and add value to our own project. So in this um, format, what we want to do more often, we want to share experience and new ideas and hopefully get a lot of advice from our communication advisor, Pascal. And in the th second half, um, we would like to open the floor for your questions um, that you come across while you're working in communication. So without further ado, I would like to get started. And I'm really glad to have Pascal today on board. Um, so Pascal, I would like to hand over to you. And I'm really curious what you have brought us today. So. Welcome, Pascal, again, and the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen, for the kind introduction. I'd say we have quite some um, volume to cover here. Let's get right at it. So today we're going to talk about testimonials as a communications tool. And this includes what is a testimonial, what can I use it for, and why is it a great tool? So basically about any kind of testimonials, but we're going to focus on video testimonials. So we actually realized it's quite a lot to cover. So we split this up in different sessions. So today is about the preparation, the so-called pre-production, if you want. And then part two is going to be in a couple of weeks. And then it's covering the production part. So the actual shooting with your cell phone and the location and all that. And then we have probably a third part, which is about the post-production. So the editing and the placement and the outreach, it's all important. Uh, we, all need, we need all the different parts to have a good testimonial and have it working. So what is a testimonial? So formally speaking, a testimonial is a statement that testifies to someone's character and qualifications. So in promotion and advertisement, a testimonial consists of a person's written or spoken statement extolling the virtue of a product. The term testimonial most commonly applies to sales pitches attributed to ordinary citizens, whereas the word endor endorsement usually applies to pitches done by celebrities. Now, in development cooperation, we can use them to gauge sentiment at various stages of our projects to show the successful progress of the project over time. So testimonials in our case serve the purpose to substantiate that our claims are right, that the project is doing great, basically. Uh, the, though that obviously should not mean that we can only use content that is doing exactly that, saying that the project or GIZ is doing great. So I actually believe that we should be a little bit soft on that because praise can be a bit too simplistic and counterproductive in the outcome. In advertisement, this might work. In our case, with our kind of target groups, asking questions 
that result in a bit more nifty responses is probably preferable. Um, so we don't want just GIZ just doing great work and this and that. That's, you know, that's something to think about. So basically my reasoning is you don't want to tell your viewer what to think, our kind of viewer. We want him or her to come to their own conclusion that you're doing great. We usually have different target groups from advertisement that, are, that seek more complex information and that requires for people to think a bit more about the subject at hand. So um, one more thing maybe to mention here, which is great for our work. Um, the, what we do is we actually capture the testimonials or the opinions of our stakeholders and we can keep them on file for later use. We come to that uh, a little bit down the line again, um, but it's, it's perfect because we can have it in the drawer, in the electronic drawer and use it when the opportunity arises or when BMZ calls, you know. So obviously you can do testimonials in different formats. And basically they come in written formats, in video or in sound bites and podcasts and so forth also. So the written content can be used to be inserted in texts, like here, here's a pull quote or blurbs in the covers of books. Um, or you can create those also just by typing out words from the video that you've taken and use it, you know, cr across medial in other media here in text in a magazine or in a website article from our SNRD on our SNRD website. So you can um, repurpose it, which also makes it ideal as a tool. So ideally a testimonial is obviously just a few short crisp words that are sufficient to pique the interest of a reader or a viewer and it should have the capacity for people to remember it. It can appear in a specially formatted way in the text or the content can just be used and built into the flow of the article as we just seen. So similar as a pull quote, quote um, a brief attention catching quotation taken from the main text of an article used as a subheading or graphic feature. Um, so the idea is always to intrigue the reader to actually start reading the whole thing or to listen to the whole interview or to watch the whole interview or to yeah just read the whole, all the project information your annual report and so forth so a testimonial doesn't have to be catchy necessarily but it can be used rather to flag more extreme and critical points as well so ideally you look for a stronger, stronger opinion, something that tells a story. Yeah, so especially you want a story if you have a bit of a longer uh, testimonial, not just a couple of sentences, because then a story works well. So a testimonial can play with the reader's minds and can include the main purpose of your project, obviously, or the main selling point, if you want, uh, in a way. So the raising of income in a village, for example. So it should be dealing probably with some of these main points. So uh, here's a typical situation where you can get a testimonial and that is at a conference. There is actually the climate COP here in Copenhagen, the, the very big one about 13 years ago, I guess it was. So. You can also do it at an office, obviously outside out where the implementation takes place, or it can be also conducted online. We come to that now. So now comes a little bit of the tricky part because I'm trying to play this here. I've come here to see how the climate change decisions are going to help farmers because there is so much knowledge, but there is very little action. My hope here, my expectations here for the Forest Day is that all what has been said this morning during the plenary sessions from those high-level personalities should be put in place and I would like action. Anyway, 
this was just to give you an impression uh, how what a testimonial can look like. This was actually um, a compilation of different testimonials put together. All these people were asked uh, the four similar or exactly the same kind of questions and we picked later on the best answers that fit into each other uh, to have here people talking about the expectations from the from the COP in the institutions and so forth and then there were more questions, outlook and so forth that was put together in a compilation of testimonials if you want. So so there's an, there's other um, testimonials, a bit longer ones, one from BMZ, one from Rajan Kotru of Ikimot there in Asia. Um, you can see these two people are looking into the camera. So that's more addressing the viewer. Um, the other ones that we had before are more looking to the side, to where I was, where the editor was, and the camera was next, next to them. I usually prefer looking to the side because it's more of a reporting style. But we come to these sort of things in the second part, but just want to give a bit of a glimpse. Yeah. So because that's important, you more address an audience when you look in the camera, like a moderator, or um, it's more reporting style if you look to the side, slightly to, next to the camera. Obviously, location can be outside. We, we mentioned that already. There's the a bus here, also a great uh, uh, place to uh, catch a testimonial from someone who came from a from a uh, field trip from the uh, event and the second one is basically with Lawrence Peterson he gave a testimonial and what I'm showing here in the second case is that you have the text insert there sort of the blurb uh, that actually is the main part of the testimonial in small again in the whole testimonial to amplify the whole thing and then obviously we have online. You can use online very well to create um, testimonials. And we come to that also in the second part. So here's another example with a scenario from a conference that is the Abidjan conference where we did a workshop actually on testimonials uh, before some, some of you might have participated there. So. First, I wanted to say quickly a bit about the usefulness of testimonials because I'm fully aware that you often need to convince your supervisor or your client, BMZ or so, about all the effort that you put into it. So that's why I thought we should go a little bit into why testimonials work, why they're a great, great tool. And it's actually rather simple because, um, yeah, it's it's compelling because they work because they use what others say about you and that is more conducive obviously than what you talk about about your project yourself yeah your project staff talks about it or you write about it yourself so it's obviously much more conducive when others say something about it principle of pr and then we also have the principle of social proof let's quickly go into that yeah social proof basically means that people like to copy the actions of others. They like to take on the beliefs of, beliefs of others. Um, and the term was coined by Robert Cialdini. This is his famous book here from 1984 called Influence, the Science and Practice. Um, and for social media, it basically means that the number of followers and fans and views, likes and favorites, and the number of comments that a user has made positively affects how other users perceive them, how they value them. So a user with a million followers is perceived more trustworthy and reputable than a similar user with only 1500 users or followers. Yeah. So why is that? Let's just quickly look into that. Um, two factors are, are important. One is uncertainty. So uncertainty is a major factor that encourage the use of social proof. People are more likely to incorporate in opinions of others through the use of social proof when their experiences with a situation are ambiguous, when they are not sure that they have the correct conclusions. And um, yeah, so that's very important in our case where people don't know anything about 
the project about maybe Africa or development cooperation. So that's where it's important to show the numbers, um, how many other people are interested in this and watching this. It's a sort of certification. And the second factor is similarity. Similarity of the viewer uh, and that group of viewers with the person that gives the testimonial. That similarity um, is very important. Um, it could also be aspects that make the viewer relate to the attestant, you know, the testimonial giver. So let's say just both are into surfing. So then maybe the one can be very young and the other quite old, a well-known surfer. It still works because they have the similar interest. So this relatability similarity is very important. And um, yeah, people are especially likely to perform certain actions if they can relate to the people who performed the same actions before them. So in other words, uh, testimonials work even better when, uh, when you target people here in Germany who don't really expect uh, to have, that you don't expect to have much contact with development issues. So, but still clearly you need to make sure that your content appeals to your target group. So you, when you think of that, not just, don't just think of relatability, also think what is appealing in general, clearly. Yeah. So, oh, okay, here it's a jump over this. It's very stereotypical. There's a couple of teenagers that read Homer and uh, it's only because they are made believe on Instagram that there's a lot of other teenagers that also start reading Homer classic. Yeah? So it's just a little funny detail for you to see that you can make even teenager read classic text if they are about to believe that other teenagers do it as well. So when it comes to talking about impact and data for it, to prove it, GIZ and other development cooperation organizations pretty much rely on using their own staff to talk about it, to testify if you want. So. This is an example here that we did with uh, SNID. I guess it was it was it was very well received, yeah. But still, it just uses basically its own crowd. Only in the center you see some there, some other participants in in the movie. But the testimonials were basically GIZ staff. So bottom line, it's much better when you use someone else to attest of your great work, as when you blow your own tr trumpet. So consider using all sorts of different types of people who have a stake in your project. That's my message. Uh, maybe even include those who are not, who are, or let's say more indirectly affected by it. Yeah, even those who can maybe talk a little bit negatively about it belong to your full picture that you want to get. So adding, adding these voices to your communications makes your approach much more relatable and credible because there's always critical voices. And now you can always edit out passages that you really don't want in there. So for example, if somebody is really ranting negatively about your project, maybe because they were in the control group and they didn't receive the benefits, well, yeah, I don't know, uh, then you can always tell your supervisor, listen, just let him talk. We can not to use it or edit certain parts out. So it's not a big deal, but I would strongly advise to consider using also a bit more negative or critical voices. Let's call it critical rather. So basically anyone can obviously provide you a testimonial. So my recommendation is if you haven't done yet, uh, do a stakeholder mapping and include your different kinds of staff, your locals, your hierarchy, all the people targeted by your project ex actions, the ex experts, the network, the politicians, you name it. You know, all these people that are affected by it indirectly or directly. In other words, it could be people as well that for some reason don't really like what you're doing, as I said. Yeah? So then in the next step, you identify individuals for each of these groups that you have ad identified. That's very important because quite often in communication strategies, there's these groups identified. And when it comes to identifying individuals, 
and having an email address or a telephone number, they don't, you can't, can't really come up with some. That's, that's, you know, policymakers. In some developing countries, you will have difficulty finding names for that. So identify individuals for, in these groups and then make sure you identify a good balanced mix of people. So in terms of color, gender, status, which kind of politics they follow, you know, parties, all this that is important for you to be inclusive, obviously, because keep in mind who you want to target, obviously, but you want to be inclusive. inclusive we, we talk a lot about inclusivity in development cooperation, but in, in, in communication, it sometimes lacks when it comes to these things. So then figure out who do these people relate to most, your, your target group, yeah, and then select from that selection. And if there's a, a view count in your, in your, in your tools that you use, um, you know, how many views was the video shown on, on, is shown on YouTube, for example, and you can turn that on and off, make sure that um, you turn it on, especially if the numbers are going up, because remember, social proof, people will go for that if the numbers are good. So uh, one tip on that side, if you prepare all your materials later on and have everything ready, your accompanying texts and text stuff and videos, make sure that you ask your colleagues to watch and like your materials in the first 72 hours. Because if there's a slight push in the beginning, um, then the algorithms know, ah, this is something promising and the algorithm will push that uh, from, from the electronic side. You know, I know you, we can talk a lot about, you know, what an algorithm does and not. There's specialists for everything, but this, this certainly works. So when you do your selection, another thing is in terms of video, so don't rely too much on the titles of people, you know, the, where they are in the institutions. I know we are sort of obliged to do this sometimes, but you need to remember if you use video with your cell phone, that some people don't come across on camera. Some people, yeah, they just can't really formulate structured sentences enough to come across on camera. So if your managing director from your partner is not really capable of doing that, then you need to find a way around that to use somebody else. You need to say, oh, we need a woman or we need this and that, or, you know, it, it's just no use uh, to have somebody on camera who can't really speak into, it, into the camera. Next step would be that you note down which kinds of points you want to get from each one in your mapping so that you can come up with a comprehensive concept of viewpoints and interests that you want to cover. Obviously, for all that to happen, you should do some research. And I know you work with subject matter experts all the time. But still, as a comms person, you also need to know what the area you want to cover is all about. Yeah? So to get the good testimonials, you should be really informed about that special area. Um, what are key aspects of this area? And also a little bit, what are its idiosyncrasies? Uh, you know, what is really very different um, from this area? And also maybe the people uh, that you interview, what, what is maybe something interesting about them? So research them also. Yeah? So remember, again, you're not looking for cheap praise of the project. We want reflected insights on the work done. So the testimonial givers should have this capacity to give a constructive criticism, not just say it's great and this and that. Yeah. So what is one key objective you want to bring across with testimonials? What is the format you want to use to show the testimonials? These are questions that you should ask yourself. So for example, if you want to do a compilation, you should have the same questions for each one. So you have a set of different answers that you can choose from later on. And they all obviously address the exact same question. So we spoke about the different actors in your field already, and let's make it I advise you make a table in which you record what each one stands for. What are their backgrounds? What are their key interests? And why are they in the game, so to speak? 
Do I have a good reflection of all the interests? What makes a certain individual special that you can tease out and note that in your mind map or whatever you want to use. You might not get everyone you wanted to do the testimonial for you. So you need to make sure that you don't lose the balance of the views and the representation that you initially planned for. So this is especially true when you work at a conference where you might not only speak to people you know, but you have to grab passers-by who you want to get to speak to you. Yeah? So there you people always tend to seek out people that are somehow close to them, that speak their language, that are their age group. And yeah, so there you be, need to be really careful that you don't uh, take the easy choices, basically. So in terms of the plan, it helps to have a lot of details set from the beginning, both in terms of content and, birth, uh, and also in terms of techno the technology involved. One thing that I can say with technology, with all the camera stuff and so, you need to be really flexible in, in your mind. Because with video recording, there's always something that goes wrong. And um, it's usually not a good idea to try to go back to what you planned initially, to try, always try to force it back. Because video productions, um, yeah, they always go wrong somewhere. So you need to be flexible there and take it from where you are. Don't try to go back. Just a little side, side uh, hint. When you prepare interviews, um, then you have the situation on a conference. Obviously, you need to be very quick. But let's say you do it from your office in a little bit longer planning. You want to do it online or you want to go to their office or they come to you. So you have some time. So then you set, you should set up calls to discuss with these people, not just the date and the location, but also the content and the format you intend to use, where the whole thing is going to be published and obviously who you work for and all that. So give this some time. Sometimes it helps for people that are a bit hesitant um, because obviously some people can't speak uh, publicly about their institutions so you can always mention that they remain in control tell them you're not a journalist you're basically doing public relations and you will certainly not re misrepresent them and they stay in charge yes yeah, so you they don't sign off on something and then they don't have any say about it you will go back to them and, and clear, clear clear with them what they said and they can all go also get clearance from their supervisors if necessary in their institutions. Um, a good point is in which we can't really go into here now is using a release form, something that they sign that they're okay with this. Um, sometimes this is quite, quite good to have. Yeah. So people, um, yeah, sometimes people change their minds in, in awkward ways and then you want to have this in writing. So, um, remember, if you work at a conference, you have, need to be really quick. So you better also prepare a small, really small and quick um, pitch that you that covers the most important aspects in a very few sentences while people run by. If you want to catch them um, for a, a quick interview, yeah. then remember you might need an interpreter. Someone, um, you know, some people are speaking not the language that you're fluent in, not always just English and French. You also want people that speak local languages, maybe. So you can use a professional that is at the conference, but usually it's a good idea to involve your local staff there. The only thing that you must remember that these people are in those communities and they have interests themselves, and they might not always translate every, everything uh, the way that you really asked and the, the, the responses they, they get. So they're in the game. So be, be a bit aware of that. So if you're not on a public street, but inside, you must remember that you usually are on a private property. And technically, you need to get a permission to film from the organizers or better from the property owners. So this is usually not an issue if you see media running around. It's a very good uh, a big 
um, conference, then you probably can just ignore that. But if it's a smaller one, you know, an expert talk or something, you need to make sure that you, that you have that okay, ideally written from, from the property owner. So if you go into BMZ in there, they will probably ask you to get it from their media department and they might be sitting in there with you when the filming takes place. Hmm. Um, we're not at the production yet, but since we're talking about legal stuff a bit here, you should make sure that when you take a picture that let's say this plant there that would be a piece of art if it's if i stand always like this and it's always in the picture and it becomes a a, a part of my construction as a visual construction then then this piece of art then i need to have the rights to use that piece of art and then yeah so then legally it becomes more complicated so just a small hint try to stay away to have art pieces featuring in your pictures prominently if they're in the background and you can't really see them because it's a bit blurry and so that's fine but just to stay away from that that can give you some trouble then one thing remember if you are editor and camera person in one then you will have a lot of challenges so you might want to split classic you have a, someone who does the camera work and someone who does the talking because it's really sometimes very difficult to to do to, to cover both areas at the same time so you might want to hire a pro camera person or you use someone from your staff um, uh, when you use a pro person then you have basically some professional experience that can also help you with the editing they have a lot of experience and they can give you some hints hey don't do it like this and that so because most camera people can do a whole lot more than just doing camera work they do know about editing as well be a bit hesitant to automatically give this job to the intern um, that happens to be with you right now because being young doesn't necessarily mean you're capable of taking nice mobile videos by default yeah I see that all the time. That's not, not really, that's just a cliche. So one more point, uh, prepare for you want, where you want to film. Um, remember, if you go into a conference, you still need to find a spot where things are not so noisy. And uh, so when you get there, you should get there early and make sure that you, that you identify these spots. Um, I'm going to go a bit quicker. Uh, let's, okay, let's speed this up a whole lot more. You can always look up uh, the notes later on if you want to. So if you get to the conference, um, make sure that you're there um, and that you are prepared that you won't be having any time during the breaks. Yeah, so no, no, no fancy food for you because that's where usually your work takes place. Make sure again that you get a diverse diversity and balance of people and have your questions catalog ready. Ideally, I'd say questions should probably not be more than four. Even if you, if you do a proper interview, you want to um, keep things very short. Ideally, if you're looking for testimonials, you're not going to use the whole footage anyway. So you just want to have the, the parts where people say very interesting things so you need to to basically push for that yeah so four questions and then take the liberty to divert off the initially um, set framework and ask some other questions usually why is that how is that to dig a bit deeper to get people to give um, something of their feeling um, that they have towards the subject because video as opposed to writing is very good to um, convey feelings and emotions and obviously you see it's a certain person asking so it's a personal opinion in any way it's not just for the institution usually um, that they work for so sometimes it might even happen that uh, someone asks you what would you want me to say so that's actually not completely untypical in a, in a way it happens quite frequently is 
people that are quite professional, you know, they want to get it done, don't have time. They basically ask you, what do you want them to say? And then they obviously still say what they want, but you know, that just quick quickens things up. So be prepared for that, that you, that you know what you actually want from them. Two more quick things. You obviously need to talk to them about how you want to use the video and get the agreement, the release and for, for those parts. So about the questions to ask, you want to avoid lengthy answers. And one way of doing this is that you never ask for all the factors that lead to a situation, for example. Don't let your interviewee start with first, secondly, thirdly, then, then you should interrupt because you want that one main most important factor, you know, singular. You want it briefly and focused and you want to get them to, to make a commitment because that's, that's a strong opinion. So go back and insist until you get it in one sentence. Ask them, can you just formulate that in one sentence? So this is already a little bit about part two, but um, yeah, basically we can wrap this up. Testimonials are supposed to be personalized. Yeah, so you, want, you don't want objectivity. You want an, not, not an expert overview. You want them to commit to one thing. So the questions part, obviously, you can talk about that in, in long details and you could use some proper examples for that because it's not so easy to just say it in theory. You can have a couple of questions in front of you and say, listen, look, just always think of not just what you want people to say and what you want to ask therefore, but also consider really sit down and think about what will people, your, your target probably answer. And then if you think, okay, they're going to go really into, into a wide area, then you have the wrong question. So one trick is what journalists do. You use a statement first that sort of narrows down what you want to talk about and then ask the question about it so that you don't leave it so open for the response, respondent to answer. Yeah, so just don't talk about, about when the question is about climate change, don't, don't ask about just climate change, say, well, in Ethiopia, the situation is like this and this and that, and that and that happened. Does ha this have something to do with that? So then you narrowed this down substantially to a particular situation. Okay, let's just leave it with that, but I'm, I, I'm at, my, at the end here now anyway. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for, for your input and um, your experience sharing. Uh, thank you very much um, for for the first half of it. So I would like to open now the floor for um, for all your questions, or comments, um, or maybe also from from your experience uh, that you would like to to share with us. So um, right now I don't see any question in the chat so far, but a comment from Anne Marie Mattis um, that she really likes your uh, tips and tricks. Um, so thank you for that, and also for from Laura Korb um, that she says um, that is really insightful and um, helpful. Thank you. So I see your hand up. So Anne Marie Mattis, please come in. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't ask a question, but I would like to encourage everybody to, to well, to maybe to share experience that is uh, where now uh, the 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 contribution of Pascal could help to avoid such experience in the future. Okay, because I think we can learn from uh, the tips and the tricks. And we can also learn from from uh, the short from our own shortcomings. Okay, for that reason, I was really listening a lot, a lot. Okay, so and sharing a, a bad experience or a weak experience is a sign of strength and analysis. So just just uh, go about it, and maybe even anecdotes and happy things will come out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for, for the comment. And I see already another hand up. So Simon, please come in. Yes, hello everyone. And uh, thanks for the interesting input. Um, I was wondering um, if there's like a pro and con of briefing the person giving the testimonial before. So sharing the questions explicitly saying, this is what I'm going to ask you. Uh, 
versus really asking the question spontaneously, whereas the responses might also be a bit more spontaneous and authentic. So do you have a take on that? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to answer immediately? I guess so. Yeah? We don't have like a whole lot of hands up. I think um, I prefer basically when people come with an open mind. Yeah. Um, oh, not that they're closed minded just because I sent them the questions, but you know what I mean, I guess. So some people, especially have experts, they over prepare, they formulate out, formulate sentences. And then it becomes difficult. Their speech becomes a little bit hampered, and uh, yeah, and 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 gets too long because they they think about it too long, and so that's why I prefer prefer that they don't know the questions before. The other, on the other hand, you have some people that just simply want to know what it's all about and want to have their say, maybe, and say, "I'm not going to talk about this. I can't talk about this and that." So you need to be able to have it yeah, for those people. And some people actually come out uh, very well when they prepare. So it's not, it's not what I said first is not necessarily true for, for all of them. So the, the, the point is that I think you should always tell them it's only a frame because you want to be on the safe side when you dig a bit deeper or when you, you want to go with the flow. If, some, if a quick answer is, uh, is very nicely formulated, and some of the stuff that you wanted to ask a little bit later has already implicitly been uh, asked. If you then go back to your paper and you just ask the question, then it looks completely weird because everybody thinks, oh, but didn't he just answer that already? And didn't he, didn't that interviewer not listen? So that's, um, I think, the point. So you need to go with the flow. And therefore, you need to tell people when you do tell them up front that you might divert off the script, so to speak, so that they're not upset if you all of a sudden ask different questions. So the trick is here to stay with the flow then and yeah, not to divert off completely into another area that they're not comfortable with. But then also they obviously can say, I'm not going to answer this since everything is recorded and, and will not be used then later on it's PR, then you're fine. So I don't know if that does that answer your question, Simon? Yes, very much so. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Perfect. I saw another hand up, I, but I think it's down already. Maybe it was the same question. So I would go um, to um, Arthur Slender. Over to you. I yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I have a general question regarding video length. It might be the case that you tackled this subject at the very beginning of your presentation <laughs> and I missed it. but. As we can see at a global scale that we have, uh, we have a trend towards shorter videos. If we talk about formats such as TikTok, Snapchat, etc. So um, let's suppose we have a sequence of testimonials. Uh, what would be your suggestion for an ideal uh, video length? Hmm. Because we, we uh, just this week we had a discussion about video lengths of um, testimonials and project presentations, and we came up with two different uh, lengths of three minutes and thirteen minutes, and uh, I saw myself opposed to a, to a pretty huge group of people who wanted to stick to the format. Hmm. Well, you know. Obviously, you can say like the compilations we did from the COP, then there people were talking much longer and that material was later used for something else as well. You know, some NGO, farming NGO got the material. We only used a couple of words to, to be inserted into that compiler with the four questions and answers. So then obviously you need to stick to that format. But in general, I would say when you say that TikTok and these formats get um, shorter, then you need to look at what is the information that they carry and what is their sort of their clients, what they want to actually get across and who are the target groups, what they're interested in. Um, I was in a, a meeting with the Social Media Marketing Society from San Diego and the boss was there telling about two years ago that they are dis doing their clients a disservice with being on Facebook with their particular client 
because Facebook would be like a, like a, a billboards on the highway where you rush by. And if they're trying to get the, the complex information of a tech company onto those billboards and people just thumb through and rush by, you cannot get it to them. So the answer is basically, you, you need to have the length that you need to have to get your information across. If you can't shorten it, some things cannot be reduced in complexity without losing major aspects, then don't. The other side is don't, don't drag out things too long. So you want to get, you want to um, do front loading. You need to have something interesting up front and you need to keep the attention, but you also need to keep it throughout. So, so this, what depends, what it depends on is sort of how long does it feel the video is not how long the counter is. So if I feel entertained or informed for three and a half minutes, fine. If I'm informed for 10 minutes, also fine. Yeah. So, I think th that's sort of the answer, you know, you can go as long as you can keep the attention. If you have a certain format that you need to go in there because you have a, a set of interviews, then you obviously need to be able to squeeze that. Yeah. Then the difficulty is probably already in the pre-production, what we discussed today, that you answer, uh, that you ask the questions in a certain way and you insist on getting it repeated. Um, so that the, the, that the responses are short enough because you can't really, like with writing, you could, you could reduce, obviously you get more abstract, you edit, but if you edit video, you can't really shrink everything. You know, the words are there and you can't cut, you can have jump cuts so that the picture goes like this, but it's not so nice, but still, you know, you're, you're limited in that sense. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes in some aspects yeah it doesn't really help i guess if you have some people that want something short it's difficult to convince them that uh, th that it should be maybe a bit longer because you feel that it, it's still okay yeah 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 it, it sometimes the trouble is i guess that the people that review the material know a lot about it and they don't want to spend the time on listening to this whereas sometimes your target groups out in africa are quite willing to listen to something longer. I see that all the time, especially if it's Africans in the videos, they, they tend, to, tend to listen to it much longer. And maybe one, one, one more point, if you, if you create videos that are only one minute long and you go through the metrics later on to evaluate how good your materials are, there's your view, your number of views, but there's also your average view duration. If you have one minute videos, obviously, your average view duration cannot be three minutes. Yeah. So it affects your metrics in a way also, if you want to keep people's attention. Sorry, but I now okay. interrupted you again. Uh, no, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I think I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much for your very insightful um, elaboration of your answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's another hand, but I um, saw a hand from uh, Masai Mitiku. So yeah, and it's already up again. So over to you and your question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the presentation was good. And uh, our connection was pulled that. I just want to know that if there is any special thing uh, the present mentioned at the end of uh, uh, his presentation about Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, for me, it was not audible uh, for. I think there was a bit of a buffering problem because sometimes the words yeah. were very long and then they came very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you can ask your question again because we had some uh, difficulties understanding you because of, um, um, yeah. I think, the bandwidth. Um, it was a little bit shaking. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can come again, please. Uh, the presentation was good. And uh, I just want to know that he has mentioned something special about Ethiopia at the end of his presentation. Am I correct or not? If he mentioned that, to clarify that for me, because I'm here a communication. Uh, the second question, 
Justin E. Okay, I don't know if I got the end right. I don't. Maybe you put it in in the chat. I yeah. can say yeah. I can say something about the Ethiopia. Uh, that was a very uh, it just was a made up example, you know, to just uh, make a point about you know how to construct a question. Uh, there's nothing in particular about Ethiopia. It could have been Kenya or Germany or yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Sorry. And, and no problem about that. Uh, the other question is, do you know rapport building? Rapport building. No. no. Record building? Okay. Rapport. 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 Yeah. I think this is how to have the relationship with the, with the person you are interviewing and filming. That's the rapport. Yeah. If I have well understood, and I think our colleague uh, Mitiku he wants to have a clarification what that means. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for yeah. <laughs> for support. Important. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't used that term. Yeah, basically, what I get from it is that obviously you need to build up a, a little bit of a relationship with your interviewee, and uh, for that you should do your research that that you show that you know something about the subject that you uh, respect the person in their um, in, in with their answers that so, so you don't contradict them during the interview in in a sense but i haven't really prepared much on 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 this now how you build rapport i think um maybe it goes a little bit to what anna marie had asked about you know or, or, or I try to encourage people to to um, to come up with their mishaps and so forth. I think you need to just do these things and uh, experience certain situations and learn by doing. They so you know it's very important that that you just do it. You know because there's so many things. I could have gone on for hours and hours on this. There's so many things to learn about that, and not everything applies to you because you naturally. Um, don't do certain mistakes or have certain preferences for you. Others would be better, uh, would be the problems. So just try and um, we can offer maybe that you just um, send us some samples and we can give you some critique. But with the rapport building, I haven't really thought about that for now. No, it's not nothing in particular that I think that is not true for basically any sort of communication when you start talking to someone. So that's not unique to the interview situation too much, I think. But I haven't really prepared for this. Yeah, can't tell you more about that. Sorry. The hand is still up. Is there a follow up question from you, Masai? Oh, sorry, sorry, no. Okay. I have no oh. question. I have no... Okay. Okay. Are there are there any other questions um, for Pascal? Comments. Okay. Maybe I can say one thing to on in terms of the encouragement. You know we. We do a lot, whole lot of writing and things, uh, and in terms of video, it can be really gratifying because you you reach a different mode of interaction with people. It can be really, um, yeah, fun and yeah, gratifying to get certain experiences across. And you actually once it's all finished and you get it out there and you 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 have yourself invested uh, into the whole project more than just creating questions maybe but also doing the whole stuff you, you get a product out and that gets some recognition so on that sort of personal staff level it can be really gratifying to do these things yeah it's a reflection from other people on the work you do and you create that yourself so that's why i want to encourage you it can can be really great i yeah, thank you for for this addition. I have one final hand up. Um, it's from uh, Julika, and then I would like to wrap up for today. Thank you. Over to you, Julika. 
Thank you, Eileen. Um, it's a very small question. I guess the best way of distributing these um, made testimonials will be tackled during the next events. Yes. Or, yeah, okay, perfect. Then I'm very looking forward to it and thank you very much. Okay, perfect. This leads me to uh, the question um, in the chat. Um, if we have set a date um, yet, um, we are hoping to have the second session um, um, before the Christmas break, but uh, you will be informed and we will send out uh, the invite um, yeah, very soon. Yeah, and I promise so, I keep it a bit yeah. shorter too, because this time I had so much time. So, you know, typical problem counts for me as well. I had too much to talk about. So next time it will be will be a bit shorter. Okay, great. And then we would have more time for, for your question. And it, your question doesn't have to be related to um, video testimonials. So if you have other communication questions, they are also welcome. So um, looking at the time, it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you very much for joining in today. Um, thank you for your experience sharing, for your questions, and especially thank you, for um, Pascal, for, for your insights and your presentation. We are happy to share it, uh, the recording and the uh, presentation in the chat and looking forward to your um, participation in the second um, session. Have a great Friday and um, see you soon. Thank Bye you very everyone. much for listening and for your attention, kind questions. See you next time. Thank you.